Hello, thank you so much for being here. You, it's always nice to see a full room. We're here to see a, gen a really gentle introduction to AsyncIO. If you were hoping to watch another talk, you're still in time to leave the room hurriedly. So I'm here to introduce Greg Saunders, who has been programming in Python since 1995. That was version 1.2, according to his recollection, which is better than mine. He's got a PhD in computer science and works in the financial industry. He has for the past 10 years. And he currently works for Optiva, which is a financial services um, firm as a software developer. So please, a hand for Greg. Well, oh, thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, I imagine many people have tried to uh, give a, uh, a gentle introduction to AsyncIO, so I'll add my name to that list. Hopefully, I uh, will be among the uh, better and not the worst ones. Uh, well, obviously, uh, I've just been introduced, so all of that is, uh, you've already been told, but uh, that's me. So let's move straight into it. Uh, in the talk today, I want to start by uh, sort of asking us why we, we even need AsyncIO in the first place. Then I want to talk about how we can do two things at once without threads. Then we'll get a handle on the future, talk about the select module, talk about transports, protocols, and we'll put it all together in a live demo, tempting the hand of fate, as live demos always do. So why do we need async I.O.? I.O. is really slow, really, really slow. I'm sure you all know this, right? You've all been downloading something from the internet, and it takes way longer than it should. Uh, so <clears throat> if you think about it, uh, the, uh, I had a look on Google, the uh, common SSD latency time, which is a time from when you make a request to when you get your data, can be uh, measured in uh, the milliseconds. There's 1,000 milliseconds in a second, but there's uh, literally billions of CPU cycles every second. So if you're waiting for that I.O. to happen, you're wasting lots of CPU cycles. So how can we use that time efficiently? That's what we want to do. And one way to do that is the so-called reactor pattern. Uh, there's the, uh, the description from Wikipedia. I'll let you read that. Uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, and the basic idea is what we're going to do is we're going to wait for some event to happen. Uh, because I.O. is so slow, these events aren't going to happen very often in computing terms. And uh, then we're going to do something when the event occurs. We're going to react to that event. So just comparing async I.O. to threads, an async I.O. program is typically a single threaded program, which means you don't have to worry about synchronization. You don't have to worry about locks and semaphores and queues and such like this. Now, you can write uh, a multi-threaded async I.O. program, but typically the threads will be relatively independent of each other. So you'll have less to worry about in terms of synchronization. Uh, interestingly, in a multi-threaded program, the switching between threads occurs whenever the CPU, or sorry, whenever the operating system thinks it's a good idea. But in async I.O., the, the uh, context switching among the, the quote-unquote threads uh, is actually controlled by the application. The application defines the points when this can occur which means they can occur at a, a points that are appropriate for the application, not just randomly, uh, as happens with threads. So async I.O. is particularly good for I.O. bound tasks, uh, whereas threads are typically better if your uh, task, or at least part of your task, is heavily CPU bound. It's doing a lot of uh, computational work, uh, and so you want to shunt that work off to a separate thread uh, <clears throat> as opposed to an async I.O. where you typically have very little work to do, you just need to do it every time there's an I.O. event. Okay, so that's a bit of a justification for why we might want async I.O. So how can we have concurrency without threads? How can we do that? Can anyone tell me what this is a picture of? Yes? An Amiga 500, give the man a Mars bar. Yes. Great, great computer. I had one of these when I was young, back in 1989. I imagine some people in this room weren't even born then. Believe it or not, we did have computers back then. This was a particularly great one. Uh, this little computer has a single-core CPU running at the whopping 7 megahertz. That's 
megahertz, right? <laughs> it had pre well, the, actually, the predecessor model to this was uh, released in 1985. The Amiga 500 was just a cost reduced version of the Amiga 1000. Uh, and it had preemptive multitasking way back in 1985. So you can have concurrency even if you don't have a multi core CPU, even if you don't have a particularly fast CPU, right? The way that it works, of course, is that you just do a little bit of work for one uh, piece of, uh, for one task, and then you switch and do a little piece of work for another task. And you do that lots of times every second, and it looks like the tasks are all running concurrently, but they're not really, right? So that's how we can have concurrency without multi-core CPUs or threads or anything like that. So let's have a quick demo and uh, we'll see what we can do with this. So where am I? Oops, that's not what I want. There we go. So what I'm gonna try and do is do a little bit of a duet with Python and async IO, if I can get this to disappear. Okay, here's my little uh, duet with Python. Uh, hopefully you all know the song, Anything You Can Do, I Can Do Better. I won't try and sing it because you'll all just run away. Um, so Annie's lines are, anything you can do, I can do better. And Frank responds, no, you can't. And Annie responds, yes, I can. So uh, that's what it's gonna do. So let's just run it to uh, see what happens. See if it actually works. Right, we'll just see if we can move that up. No, we can't, so I'll just scroll. There we go. Anything you can do, I can do better. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. And so on. So we've got two pieces of code running kind of concurrently. Um, and what we've got down the bottom here, I'll just scroll up to show you that, is the loop which is making this happen. So we pop. Annie and Frank onto our queue, and then we, uh, sorry, we push them onto our queue, and then while the queue's not empty, we just uh, pop the first thing off the queue, print its line, uh, append it back onto the end of the queue, and keep going until the end. Okay, now, Annie and Frank, in this case, are what are called generators. Everyone familiar with generators? Yeah? Oh, good, most of you are. Excuse me. Generators are, are these uh, Python functions that have these uh, special yield keywords. Uh, and basically what happens is when a generator yields, uh, it yields a result back to whoever called it, but it maintains its state so that we can come back to it later on and carry on from where we left off, right? That's how this uh, little demo works. Now, an interesting little thing about, uh, about generators is that they're actually bidirectional. And what I mean by bidirectional is that you don't just get information out of a generator, you can send information in to a generator. So I'll just quickly show you how you might do that. Singer.sim. Now, the generators that we have here aren't expecting us to send anything into them, so I'm just going to send none into them. But uh, you, could, uh, you could send an actual value into them, and that would work fine. And we'll just run that. And there we go, it still works. Okay. So generators, they're bidirectional. That will become important later. Okay, let's go back to my presentation here. Okay, so there's our generators, there's our loop. So what have we got here? <clears throat> so we've got two generators running kind of concurrently. We've got context switches that occur at application-defined points, wherever the yield is, right? And there's a loop that's managing running these things, right? Now, what have we really achieved? I mean, come on. I could have just uh, printed each of the lines in order and gotten exactly the same result. The code would have been shorter. It would have been much simpler. Why did I bother? Well, what I've been able to do is I've been able to arrange the code in logical units. I've been able to put Annie's lines in one function or generator and Frank's lines in another. I've been able to arrange them in uh, a logical way, right? And that's really what we've achieved. Now, in async I.O., we use generators, but they're called coroutines. They're special kinds of generators. And the loop that executes them is called the event loop, okay? And it's the thing that is responding to events. Okay. So now let's talk about futures. And I'm running a bit behind time, so I'll go quickly. What is a future? 
OK, so all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. Hopefully, you've all heard that quote. A future is just an indirect reference to a forthcoming result, which is a fancy way of saying, I'm going to have a result for you, just I don't have it yet. OK, that's all that it means. And you can ask the future to call you back when it has the result. So what are some real world examples of futures? Checks in the mail. Don't call us, we'll call you. Can you lend me 50 bucks? I'll totally pay you back. Totally. That's what makes it a future. Right? So let's, let's have a look at what it might look like if we were using futures in our demo. Where's my uh, editor gone? There it is. OK, let's see if we can get rid of that. OK, so here we have uh, a version of our little duet which is using uh, futures. So Annie is going to print out her first two lines, and then she's going to create a callback uh, so that when Frank is done with his line, uh, she'll get called back to say, yes, she can. And then Frank is going to print his line, and then he's going to tell Annie that he's done. OK? And so uh, I'm going to use some async IO code here to run this. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. And, uh, and basically, all this is doing is creating a future for us. We call Annie. Uh, we give Annie the future so that she can register her callback. We call Frank. And then we just run until the future has finished running, which this, this last line, all it's really doing is making sure that the, uh, the callback actually occurs. So if I run that, you can see Annie prints her line, Frank prints his line, and then Annie gets called back and prints her line. So that's futures. OK, back to my presentation. OK. So the problem is that callbacks aren't really the nicest way to do things. Imagine if you, uh, if you had to do everything with callbacks, right? You'd be defining callbacks all over the place. You'd need to pass futures around every which way but loose and register your callbacks on them. Uh, it just wouldn't be very nice. Wouldn't it be great if we could write our code in line like that first version of the generators that we had and uh, do it that way. So again, we'll switch over to the uh, live demo. And where's our pie chart? Keeps disappearing on me. Uh, where are you? OK, so here's a version which allows us to do the code in line. So now, what's happening here is we're using an async I.O. generator. The keyword async before the def there is what turns our generator into an async I.O. coroutine, OK? And the await is uh, really just a fancy way of doing a yield, right? Uh, so Annie's going to print her lines. Then she's going to wait for Frank to print his line. Then she's going to do her line again, and she's going to keep doing that until the entire chorus is sung, right? So now we've got our code in line, right? We can write our code in such a way that it, uh, it stops at the points where it needs to and then carries on when uh, it's uh, ready. OK? So what's actually happening here is that the event loop in async.io is going to uh, handle this uh, callbacks for us. It's going to set up the callbacks, handle them for us, and allow us to write our code in this nice, clean, logical way uh, so that we don't have to register the callbacks ourselves. Let's go back here. Now, the way that it does this is uh, what's called a task in async.io. So a task is just a, uh, a piece of uh, data structure that uh, runs a coroutine in the event loop. And at each step, the coroutine is going to do basically one of three things. It's going to await, or yield, a future, right? And what the task is going to do is it's going to say, all right, oh, I can't continue with this coroutine until that future is ready, right? So it'll put it aside, right? And later when that future becomes ready, it'll say, aha, the future's ready. I can continue running this task. The other thing that the uh, coroutine might do is it might await or yield another coroutine, right? And in that case, the, uh, the task will say, ah, oh, I've got a coroutine to run. I'll start running it. And when it needs to wait for something, it'll do the same thing over again, right? And the last thing a coroutine might do is return a result, right? In which case, the task knows, OK, this uh, thing is done, right? It's finished, 
Okay? So that's what a task is. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the select module. Who's heard of the select module? Python. Yep, fair smattering of hands. Basically, select is an OS function that helps us wait for I.O. Right? It basically, uh, you give it a whole bunch of I.O. channels, like uh, files or network sockets, and uh, it tells you which of them are ready for reading or writing, whatever you might need to do with them. And you can tell it to wait uh, for a fixed amount of time or indefinitely. So let's have a really quick look at that. Back to Python. Okay, so here's a really contrived example of uh, how we might use select. All right, we're going to open a couple of files. We're going to put the files onto a list. We're going to put stood it out onto a list. And basically, we're going to use the select call to tell us when these things are ready. And when they're ready, we read from them or write to them. Okay? And this will print out the, uh, the contents of the files that we were just reading. Uh, kind of interleaved with each other, right? So if you think about it, this is kind of useful for our event loop. Our event loop can use this select method to figure out when I.O. is ready and then do something with it, right? That's the core of how async I.O. works. It's using so select or something like it to wait for I.O. events to occur and then uh, schedule and run the appropriate callbacks to make our uh, events happen. So that's the select module. Okay. So now let's quickly talk about transports and protocols. So what is a transport? A transport is just a way of moving data from one place to another. <laughs> that's all. Okay. Um, it's responsible for doing I.O. and buffering. There's several of them uh, in async I.O. TCP, UDP, SSL, pipes, so pipes are for uh, communicating with sub-processes, basically. So it's just a way of getting data from one point to another. Okay, so that's all the transport is. The API for transport includes methods like close, write, pause reading, resume reading, uh, etc. But note there's no read method. There's no read method because you're going to get a callback when your data is ready. You don't want to block waiting for your data to uh, be read. You just want to get called back when you get some data. So just quickly, the uh, subprocess pipes is another kind of transport. It has methods like get the process ID of the subprocess, terminate the process, kill the process. Very violent computer scientists, anyway. Uh, and datagram transports, so send, abort, so on. So you don't create transports directly, right? Instead. The event loop is going to supply methods for us that help us create them. We'll see this in a minute. I'm going to give you a demo. Right? So uh, the exa examples of the methods that the event loop supplies for you are things like create connection, create server, execute a subprocess. Now, a transport is only transmitting data or transporting data from one point to another. Right? There's no way to interpret the data. In order to do that, you need something else. And the thing you need is called a protocol. So each of these functions that creates a transport for us takes as its first argument a, a factory function for a protocol. So let's talk a little bit about protocols. So protocols basically process data as it comes in, and they, they're used to ask the transport to send data out. Right? If you think about it, a protocol uh, is, is a set of rules to uh, manage communication between uh, a couple of things. So it, you know, one side is supposed to do this, and then the other side is supposed to do that. That's what a protocol is. So in uh, async IO, you have several different types of protocols, streaming protocols, datagram protocols, subprocess protocols. And what you do as the async IO programmer is you create a subclass of one of these protocols and define how your application is supposed to behave. And, uh, uh, then your, pro the, your program responds to events uh, in accordance with the protocol you've defined. Now, I'm going to give you a quick demo. In order to do that, I'm going to be using Google's protobuf. If you don't know protobuf, don't worry, it's pretty simple. What it does is it, uh, it de serializes and deserializes messages for me so that I can transmit them over a, a byte stream, like a, a network connection. Now, the raw data in, uh, in a network message uh, could contain more than one message. There's no way of knowing how many messages it contains. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin each message with 
a two byte length field that tells me how long it is. If you want to know more about protobuf, uh, then you can uh, go onto YouTube, have a look at my talk from last year uh, on Pyrobuf. It's pretty good. Give, it, give me a thumbs up. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to remind you, you know, you've only got a limited number of chances to give someone a thumbs down in your life, so don't give one to me. <laughs> OK. All right, so quickly r running over to our protocol demo. So here is our protocol server. And uh, what I've done is I've created a subclass of asyncio.protocol. And it's got a couple of methods, connection made, right? Uh, data received, uh, and then uh, connection lost, right? So when we receive data, we're going to read the length from the data. And then we're going to use protobuf, the underscore pb2 is protobuf, uh, to deserialize our message. And we're going to calculate a reply, which is just the sum of, uh, of the message fields. And we're going to use our transport to send a message back to the client. OK? And if we have a look at the client, there's the client. So when the connection is made, we're going to create a request. We're going to send it to the other end by writing it to the transport. And when we get a reply from the transport, we'll print our answer. Now, hopefully you can see, right, what's going to happen is it's going to send a message saying, please add 3 and 4 for me. The server's going to add 3 and 4, send a message back saying it's 7, and it'll print out the answer. I'm running low on time, so I'll move on. Uh, but hopefully you can see that that's what's going to happen. So how can we put this all together? Uh, so at Optiva, we have a lot of programs that are reactive, like the async IO uh, reactive model that I was talking about earlier. They receive information from somewhere, they do something with it, and they send information back, or maybe they send it on to somewhere else. Uh, and so we've got a lot of applications like this. Um, and so we've wanted to come up with a way of testing them. And we're using a technology very similar to async IO to do that. So imagine an, a very simple automatic telemachine app, right? Really, really contrived, simple. OK, the, uh, the customer is going to uh, request of our ATM uh, that it make a deposit or withdrawal. The ATM is going to send a message to the bank saying, what's the balance in this person's account? And, uh, and then the ATM is going to decide whether they can uh, make their deposit or withdrawal. So let's go and have a look at this. OK, just need to, oops. Close that project. And ooh, what's going on here now? Okay. Okay, so our protocol is really simple. Here's our protocol, right? We have a request from our customer, uh, basically asking either to make a deposit or a withdrawal for a certain amount. And we have a reply that indicates whether it's successful or not and what the remaining balance is. And the protocol to the bank is also very simple. We're going to send the customer ID to the bank, and it's going to send back the balance. Now, <clears throat> the application itself, right? we don't need to know how that works. If I get time, I'll show it to you. But what I want to do is I want to test and see that it's working. So how can I do that? Who's familiar with PyTest? Yeah? Oh, good. Most of you. OK, PyTest, great testing framework. Allows us to write uh, unit tests that look a bit like this. Now, I'm using PyTest-AsyncIO to test my AsyncIO code, as you might expect. And here you can see I've written a test method which is using uh, our async await syntax and the first thing it's going to do is it's going to ask the client to send a request of a withdrawal for Jane Doe. And then it's going to get the results back after a while. And it's going to check that the result was successful or not. Now, I happen to know that Jane's account balance has $100 in it. So it should work. Uh, and John's also should work. But uh, the anonymous person, well, they don't have enough money. So that should not work. Now, that looks pretty simple. How did I ma manage to make this all happen? Well, all the magic is in contest. So let's go and look at it. 
Okay, so I have a couple of methods right at the top that are just uh, reading the length field and the, the message from our uh, data stream or writing the link field and the message back into our data stream. So that's just some convenience. And here we go, we've got our ATM client protocol. This is the, whoops, this is the client which is going to send a message to our ATM, okay? So when the connection is made, we remember the transport that the connection was made with. When we receive some message from the ATM, which, is, which will be in response to our request, we uh, deserialize it and we're gonna tell the future that the uh, result is ready. Five minutes, okay, and in our send request method, right, we're gonna create a request object, we're gonna set the field to the request object, we're gonna send the message on to the server, the ATM, and we're gonna create a future, right? Remember, a future is uh, just a, a promise that a result is gonna be coming soon, and we're gonna send the future back to whoever called us. So you can see what's gonna happen, right? So, uh, someone's gonna send a request, we're gonna give them back the future, and then when we get our data back from the ATM, right, uh, we're gonna tell the future that the result is ready and uh, we'll get, uh, and, and the, whoever's calling us will get our result. Now here is our uh, server. This is the server side. So when we get the connection, we just uh, remember the transport that the connection was made with. And then when we receive a request from the ATM, we're going to extract the customer ID from the request. We're going to create a reply and we're gonna send it back, okay? Now, <clears throat> whenever we start our test, we're going to need a, a bank server to be running so that the ATM can connect to it, right? So here's how we start up our bank server. We just use the create server method I told you about earlier to create a bank server. We send it back into the test, and then when the test is over, we close the server, okay? And we're also gonna need a client, uh, sorry, we're also gonna need the ATM process to be running, right? So here we're gonna use subprocess to create a uh, subprocess, which is gonna be our ATM program, right? Uh, we're gonna wait half a second so that it's ready, okay? Because it takes a, a little while to start up and uh, connect to the server. Send it back to the test, right? And then when the test is over, we terminate our ATM process. And lastly, we're gonna need a client, right? That connects to our ATM. So we use our create connection method I told you about earlier, right? And that's gonna uh, be the client that the test can use to communicate with our uh, ATM. So if we go back to the tests, you can see now that everything that's required for this test is right here in the one test framework, right? We've got the server, the bank server, we've got the ATM client, and we've got a way of starting up our ATM process. So for every test, sorry, let me get rid of the uh, file list there, if I can. For every test, we're gonna start up the bank server, we're gonna start up the ATM process, we're gonna start up the client, send our request, get our results, and it all happens really simply uh, and we can write as many of these tests as we like, right? So uh, let me just uh, see if I can get that to run for you. Oop, it didn't work. What happened? Live tests. Yeah, live tests. They never work. This worked last night. Why doesn't that work? <laughs> uh, I'm running too low on time. I can't figure out how this works, but trust me, it worked for me last night. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, am, I, am I over, am I torn up? Uh, yes, okay. So I'll just quickly show my last slide. So this is what we've managed to achieve, right? We've got a test framework with both the server side and the client side, starts up our ATM and runs as many tests as we need. Uh, and so we're using async IO to test a whole other application, which could have been written in any language. I happen to write it in Python, uh, but uh, could have been written in any language we like. We just fire it up and it connects to our server. We connect to it from our client and we run our tests. So there you go, async IO in a nutshell. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So you can find documentation in the Python standard library on the Python website. 
Check out especially the develop with AC, async I/O section, which has got some uh, some warnings and some gotchas in there to help you uh, write your programs. And time for questions. So, um, thank you, Greg. Unfortunately, we don't have time. For oh, I'm time. out of time. But there is a ten-minute uh, break between sessions, so people can move from one room to another. And I'm sure Greg is available to take questions privately. Thank you so much. Thank you.